Alright, today is Tuesday, November 23rd. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. Let's dive right into it. In focus tonight, the most expensive Thanksgiving dinner ever. And then the energy crisis and the release of the strategic reserve. And lastly, it is not just the bird that is getting slaughtered this week. It is also the country of Turkey because the lira is crashing today and has been crashing since the beginning of the year, to be honest. But let's start with the feast, the upcoming feast. And oh boy, it's going to be expensive. No thanks. Average cost for Thanksgiving dinner hits all time high. Should have bought call options on this one, not Tesla. But anyhow, here it is. Americans will need to pay up for a Thanksgiving dinner this November, as the average cost for a Thanksgiving feast for 10 is up 14% from last year to an all-time high of 53 bucks and 31 cents. And I say is it a family of 10 midgets because my turkey alone is costing 50 bucks with taxes, of course. But perhaps this is the cost for the Smurf family. Anyhow, according to an annual American Farm Bureau Federation survey released Thursday, though the United States Department of Agriculture estimates a more modest 5% price increase. Of course, the Department of Agriculture is doing a lot of cooking, not for the feast, but they're cooking the data. That's what they're serving for dinner. And good luck getting canned cranberry sauce. I shared my frustrations with you on Twitter last week that I cannot find canned cranberry sauce. All over the place I've been looking. And I know what you're going to say, bro, why don't you just get the fresh cranberry sauce? Just buy a bunch of cranberries and do your own sauce. No, 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 no. Certain things have to be canned. One of them is cranberry sauce. If you serve me fresh cranberry sauce, I'm going to grab it and stick it in your face because that's where it belongs. And I had to look all over San Diego County to find canned cranberry sauce. I found it in Pacific Beach, aka PB, where everybody's named Chad or Brad. These, of course, are San Diego jokes. I don't expect you to understand them, but PB is one of those places, if you ever wondered what it's like to have chlamydia, that's the place to go. And you don't have to do anything, by the way. You just sit there on the beach. It's airborne, airborne chlamydia. Matter of fact, the motto of the city of Pacific Beach is, it burns. Anyways, you know what else is going to be burning this season? It's your wallet. Because those prices are surging, baby, all over the place. Two supermarket chains in the southeastern United States are limiting the number of Thanksgiving staples, such as canned cranberry sauce, jarred gravy, and canned pie filling customers can buy. As holiday demand meets supply chain issues. That's why I've been saying do your Thanksgiving shopping in advance. And please do yourself a favor this year and do not waste any food because you people waste about $1,500 in uneaten food every year while we have people starving all over the place. Leftovers, that's the key word here. But it's not just Thanksgiving, by the way, that is surging prices higher. Prices are going higher regardless. So you might want to keep those leftovers for the upcoming starvation because CBS says as inflation jumps, here's a look at how much more Americans are paying for food and fuel. Fuel oil up 60%. Year over year. Gasoline up 57% year over year. Diesel fuel up 44%. What about meat? Well, prices for uncooked beef are up 15%. Boneless chuck roast up 29%. Ground beef up 18%. Bacon up 28%. Chicken breast up 9.1%. And fresh whole chicken down 3.6%. The breast, though, that costs a lot more. The rest of the chicken, who cares? Inflation is sexist when it comes to chicken. Only cares about breast? Come on, man. Not even ass? Anyways, what about uh, dairy? Eggs are up 29%. Whole milk up 8.4%. American cheese down 5.8%. And cheddar cheese down 3.3%. So let them eat cheese, I guess. What about beverages? Coffee up 6.1%. Malt beverages up 4%, wine up 3.2%, and OJ up 14%. What about snacks? Potato chips are up 4.6%. The good news is chocolate chip cookies are down about 1%. So the whole business idea of grandma opening a shop, baking cookies, that's a no-go. Other staples, white sugar up 13%, white rice up 2.9%, white bread up 1.5%, wheat bread up up 0.2%, white flour down 12%, spaghetti and macaroni down 13%. 
Are these people insane or what? But you might say, you know what? You see, inflation is transitory because uh, macaroni is down. Actually, macaroni is up. Go to the store and check for yourself. But prices are going to get even worse, meaning higher and higher and higher. And the reason is breakfast is about to get more expensive next year. Expect to pay more for some of your favorite cereals, snacks, soups, and cooking brands next year. Because General Mills notified retail customers that it is raising prices in mid-January on hundreds of items across dozens of brands. They include Annie's, Progresso, U Plate, whatever that is, Fruit Wallops, Betty Crocker, Pillsbury, Cheerios, Cinnamon Toast Crunch, Lucky Charms, Wheaties, Reese's Puffs, Tricks, and more. According to a letter, General Mills sent to at least one major regional wholesale supplier last week. For some items, prices will go up by around 20%. Once again, 20% beginning next year. So Powell says, we're anchoring inflation expectations at 2%. That's the goal. We're at 20 now. 20% inflation. Here's the shady part. The wholesaler shared General Mills' letter with CNN Business on the condition of anonymity to protect the company's relationship with its suppliers. A leader at the company said it plans to push along all of the increases to its grocery and convenience store's customers. He expects they will then pass them down to shoppers. Da -da -da -da. You and I, baby. You and I paying for all of this garbage. General Mills plans are the latest evidence that rising prices won't be going away anytime soon for some of the most recognizable food and household brands. The company is the latest consumer manufacturer to announce price hikes beginning next year, joining Tyson, Kraft Heinz, Mondelez, Procter & Gamble, Kimberly Clark, and others. All good stocks, by the way. Food manufacturers and grocery chains have faced higher costs for commodities, labor, transportation, and other expenses during the pandemic. Those costs have escalated in recent months, prompting them to raise prices to minimize the impact. The Producer Price Index, also known as the PPI, which measures the price manufacturers receive for their goods and services, jumped 0.6% last month from September and rose 8.6% annually. Once again, Powell says, we want inflation at 2%. It's 8.6% according to this one. But hey, where is inflation, right? Is it here? Is it over there? I don't see inflation. If we stop talking about it, it goes away. Anyhow, General Mills said in the letters that it was responding to higher materials and labor costs. The current operating environment is as dynamic as we've experienced in at least a decade, resulting in significant input cost inflation, labor shortages, and challenges servicing the business, General Mills said. Here's the important part. They say inflation is transitory. Inflation is peaking. Watch out here. General Mills said in September that it expects its input cost inflation to be 7 to 8 percent for its 2022 fiscal year. You hear that, Mr. Powell? And what about after the meal? After you paid all of these costs, you're full, you got your leftovers in the fridge, and you want to go out and do some shopping. My advice is don't. Just stay home, order your shit online, because it's a, it's a mess out there. Take a look. This holiday season, a cloud of fear hanging over the Bay Area. After consecutive nights of broken glass and stolen goods, haunts some of the area's most posh shopping districts. Get on the side. The spree started Friday night in San Francisco's Union Square. A swarm of vandals and looters targeted high-end stores like Louis Vuitton, Fendi, and Hermes. Witnesses posted videos of bag-toting thieves fanning out from caved-in windows. Police flooded in, attempting to pick off perpetrators as they fled. One video shows officers bashing in a car, then making an arrest after dragging a man from the vehicle. In all, nine stores were hit. Police say at least eight people arrested so far, with several weapons and thousands of dollars in merchandise recovered. This was not unplanned. Their plan was to overwhelm us. Their plan was hoping that we wouldn't be here, but we were. The next night, a massive flash mob surged through this Nordstrom's in nearby Walnut Creek. Law enforcement officials calling the attack well organized. I saw people running down the street. I probably saw 50 to 80 people in like ski masks, crowbars, night, like a bunch of weapons. Later that night, more chaos. This time, a group of about 30 thieves and looters struck at the Southland Mall in Hayward. We can't continue to allow people to freely flow in and out of this city, commit these acts and get away with it. 
Tonight, shopping districts across the country on high alert after similar incidents broke out, including another smash and grab on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. And this stunning video from a Louis Vuitton in suburban Chicago showing mass thieves bursting into the store in broad daylight, swiping merchandise and running away. Police say at least 14 suspects escaped in three separate vehicles, a holiday crime spree hitting stores at the height of their most important season. And these, of course, are organized crimes. They're not just a bunch of kids who chatted on TikTok and planned a crime. These are organized crimes planned and targeted in advance. And Governor Kim Jong-un Newsom says that he vows to up the funding for the police and prosecution. And he blasts recent retail thefts. Oh, really? This is the same state, by the way, the same governor who rewards the criminal and punishes the victim. These are California laws these days. They side with the criminal, not the victim. I'm old enough to remember that Governor Kim Jong-un Newsom, back in July, signed the bill and vowed that he's going to crack down on organized crime and theft, the grab and smash wave. He's going to crack down. He's going to show his muscles and flicks by doing nothing. And this is exactly what's going on right now. It's chaos out there. Matter of fact, Best Buy is now complaining that their profits are being damaged and the reason is organized crime. Smash and grab hurting the bottom line for Best Buy. These retail businesses are just recovering from the COVID shutdowns and lockdowns and now they have to deal with robberies. And by the way, Best Buy said that their staff the employees in the stores are traumatized and they're quitting their jobs. And right away, the stock of Best Buy crashed today. Top to bottom, it was down 20%. And it's not the only stock crashing, by the way, today. We have other retail stocks, the likes of Nordstrom, which was the victim of an organized theft and robbery effort in San Francisco. That stock is down over 20% after hours. We have the wave of crime. You combine that with a merciless market that doesn't forgive any miss, any bad numbers, and these stocks come down crashing. What's going on right now with these crashes in retail stocks will be reflected in the fundamentals of the business, meaning they're going to have to shut down stores, they're going to have to lay off employees. So all of these so-called job gains and job creations that Joe Biden is bragging about, they're going to be dented dramatically. And perhaps this is a good segue when we talk about the mismanagement and the lack of leadership in California with Governor Kim Jong-un Newsom. Perhaps this is a good segue to the insane gasoline prices we're paying here in California. You think gas prices are too high? In this California county, a gallon coal costs six bucks and that is of course old news six bucks is the norm right now take a look right now stop at the gas station is costing a lot more these yeah. days it really hurts right california just set a new record by the way for gas prices 468 a gallon but it's even higher at some local gas yeah. stations tony ginniard live in the mid wilshire area where gas prices tony are skyrocketing Makes you want to cry. Daniela, a gentleman just pulled up to this pump. I thought he was filling up until I looked at how much he purchased. Only $3.48 worth of gas. Look how much it got him. And look at the other prices. Uh, break open the piggy bank. You're going to need the extra money for uh, $5.99 for a gallon of regular unleaded. And then when you go to the premium, take a look at that. We are talking about $6.59 for premium unleaded. According to AAA, on average, the state wide price for a gallon of a regular unleaded is four dollars and 86 68 cents excuse me for 67 in the long beach uh, los angeles area for 63 orange county for 61 san bernardino and 459 in riverside county so there is a very good chance your friends driving hybrids or cars that do not depend on gas to get going will be thumbing their noses at you this morning the spike in gas price is being blamed in part on the rising cost of crude oil oil, unplanned refinery maintenance and refinery shutdowns and production issues after heavy rainfall in Northern California late October. Those comments from uh, Karen Bass on CNN, while many of us are commenting on how the price of gas is breaking our budgets, if you're gassing up in California, you are paying more on average than you'd pay in any other state. The national average price per gallon of regular unleaded is three forty one. Coming back live, uh, look at that, read it, and weep. I'm Tony Ginyard, reporting live from Mid Wilshire District 4 today in LA. And I say that our absentee governor should start working right now because he's been tweeting about boosters and volleyball teams. Meanwhile, 
families here in California are paying the highest gasoline prices in the nation. Way exaggerated prices. Even though we have oil here in California. And the reason is the excessive taxations on gasoline prices. Why? Because California governors, the corrupt California government in general, are sponsored and paid for by the so-called green lobby. You want to alleviate the pain for families, Mr. Newsom start by removing these taxes. At least as temporary measures, by the way. Till the end of the holiday season. I'm not sure if you're aware or not, but California remains under emergency declaration, under emergency rule, meaning Governor Kim Jong-un Newsom can right now, single-handedly, he doesn't need any approvals whatsoever. He can remove all taxes right now. But he's not going to do so, of course, because part of the plan is let gasoline prices surge out of whack and then we force the consumer to buy EVs and support the so-called green agenda. The problem is, where is the supply? Where are the EVs? And even the EVs that are available right now, they cost an arm and a leg. And your beloved media, the likes of uh, Chuck Todd at NBC News, he says gas prices are up, but Red America is paying more, meaning those uh, Republican rednecks with their big pickup trucks, they're the one getting hurt with all this inflation. Not us in the costs, with our fancy EVs. We're fine. It's just hurting the Trumpers. So who cares? Inflation is good. The problem with this added touch, out of mind from the Democrats and their allies, they're alienating regular people, by the way, blue-collar people, working-class people. They're pushing them away and siding with the elite. The problem is, gasoline prices are not going to hurt me. I don't even drive these days. They're going to hurt my Guatemalan gardener, who has to drive a pickup truck for a living. And you know what? He cannot afford to buy a cyber truck or an upcoming EV that's going to cost over 100 grand. So these sicko maniacs are actually hurting the middle class and the poor the most. But they're twisting the facts to say, you know what? Inflation is good. It's hurting the Trumpers. We should cheer for inflation. What a bunch of garbage. And that leads us to the remedy because the propaganda is not working. I shared the polls with you. Republicans, Democrats, independents across all affiliations are pissed off about inflation. And they're blaming the Biden administration for this inflation. And the remedy from this administration is not to crack down against the loose monetary policy, the easy money policy, printing money out of thin air, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars all over the place. With these trillions of dollars, have to chase something. With this inflation, the best assets to chase happen to be commodities, including oil and gas. And therefore, these trillions of dollars are landing into oil and gas commodities, pushing these prices higher. And of course, Jerome Powell, vacuum man, tried a cute trick by using the reverse repo facilities to reduce the cash flow and the coke in the economy. The problem is, how do you vacuum away $6 trillion worth of coke in the system? Not going to happen. This inflation is happening once again not due to the supply and demand dynamics that has nothing to do with it at all maybe it has 10 to 20 percent but that's all there is the majority of this inflation that we're seeing right now in gasoline prices and other assets is due to the cocaine from the fed the trillions of dollars that were printed out of thin air now we're paying the price but what did joe biden do he renominated the same madman the same delusional madman responsible the loose monetary policy. And Joe's trying other tricks now. Blame price gouging. That did not work. Now, in a collaborated effort, Biden's strategy is to release barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is meant for war times and emergencies. This collaborated effort started by convincing other nations, the likes of South Korea, China, Japan, India, to release barrels from the strategic reserves and now the united states of america is also planning to release the biggest batch ever from the strategic petroleum reserve about 50 million barrels remember this these barrels are meant for emergencies only war times natural disasters etc and what happened today by the way oil prices shot up higher exactly as i told you in this program why because releasing the strategic reserve is equivalent of waving the white flag that the green energy agenda has failed and the administration remains delusional about the nature of inflation and the true source of inflation which is the federal reserve and the loose monetary policy and therefore every dip in oil will be bought because guess what all of these barrels will be consumed in a matter of days the united states consumes about 20 million barrels a day releasing 50 million barrels will deplete the strategic reserve we will go through these barrels in about two and a half days that's all there is and then the government has to buy barrels from overseas again 
to top the strategic reserve. So if anything, this is bullish for oil prices. Because the flip side of this coin, you have OPEC producers who are saying, you know what, if you want to go to war, let's go to war. You want to play this cute game of releasing these strategic reserves in a coordinated manner, then we're also going to respond in a coordinated manner. You're increasing the supply, at least for now, but we also have COVID in the EU and other territories that is slowing down demand. And therefore, we have concerns about increasing supply in the upcoming year. But we're going to hold on on our planned increases in supply, and therefore, oil prices will surge higher. OPEC for now has the upper hand. And this move of releasing the strategic reserve is misguided and it fired back right away. Oil prices shot up higher. Have you noticed that every single effort by this administration works in pumping oil prices and energy prices in general higher? Every single effort fires back. This is the best administration for big oil and gas. And here's another example. The administration punished, quote unquote, punished Russia by sanctioning some of their pipelines. And guess what? Natural gas prices also popped higher. Every single effort works in pushing energy prices higher. But none of the remedies offered by the administration tackle the loose monetary policy, the source of this inflation. None. Why? Because if the Fed starts to tighten, then the equities and real estate markets will crash. And the overlords, the oligarchs, and the donor class, they're not going to like it. So what is the alternative here? If the Fed is not going to tighten, and it's going to wait till it's forced to tighten because, God forbid, the assets of the wealthy would take a hit. What is the alternative? The answer is perhaps offering a sneak peek to what's about to happen in this country. Take a look at Turkey, for example. Or if you thought Jerome Powell is delusional, take a look at this guy. This is the most insane, reckless policy, economic policy ever in history. The Turkish lira lost almost half of its value this year, and today was down about 15% in a single day. Why? Because to battle inflation, the genius over there wants to double down on the loose money policy. He wants to cut interest rates even more, defying all logic, all reason, and perhaps economics 101. When you have inflation, you tighten the monetary policy. You don't loosen it. And therefore, Turkey is facing hyperinflation right now. And the currency, the Turkish lira, is worthless. It's worth less than toilet paper. And the Turkish population is rapidly dumping the lira in exchange of the US dollar. And therefore, the dollar is shooting up higher. The lira is crashing. Turkey's lira had its second worst day ever on Tuesday as it plunged 15% before recovering some ground. The lira hit record lows against the US dollar for an 11th straight session. Turkey's currency has lost 45% of its value this year and fallen just over a quarter since the start of last week. That as inflation soars close to 20%. One minibus driver in Diyarbakir described the cost rises he's witnessed. A bag of flour was 100 lira and now it's 300 lira. What can people do? People are really depressed. People are looking abroad for jobs. President Tayyip Erdogan has put pressure on the central bank to move towards an aggressive easing cycle. His aim is to boost exports, investment and jobs, even as inflation soars and the currency's depreciation speeds up. Former central bank deputy governor Semi Tumen, who was dismissed last month, has called it an irrational experiment with no chance of success. Other economists have called the rate cuts reckless and said Turkey should change course. Tuesday's slide was the lira's worst since the 2018 currency crisis, which led to a sharp recession. The central bank last week cut rates and signalled there was more easing to come. Contrary to standard economic theory, Erdogan insists that high rates aren't needed to tame inflation. This is a historic crash, and the approach is something we have never seen before. Not even Jerome Powell is this delusional, by the way. And even Goldman Sachs now warning that the Turkish central bank will be forced to increase interest rates higher by 20% in the second quarter of 2022. What does that mean? That entire country will collapse. And it offers a dire scenario, a dire warning not to follow this path. And to avoid this path, the Federal Reserve needs right now, this moment, it needs to announce they're going to end all of their purchasing programs, tapering everything. They announce a plan, a framework, to increase interest rates by the beginning of next year. It has to happen. Yes, it will crash the stock market, but it is needed to save the economy from this dire scenario. And this is, by the way, not just my opinion. Even Professor Jeremy Siegel, a.k.a. the good professor, agrees with me. And this is what he said today. 
Let's bring in Morton School Professor of Business and Finance, Jeremy Siegel, who's on the CNBC Newsline. Something that you've been warning about, I'll give you credit, Professor Siegel, for a long time, which is rising inflation becoming more persistent, becoming more dangerous. We are hearing the Treasury Secretary saying she's a little more concerned about it. Powell talked about it. Brainerd talked about it. Biden's talking about it. Does that mean the Fed is going to have to move faster, which is what, what some of this volatility this week is about? Uh, absolutely, they're going to have to move faster. Uh, uh, there's there's no question that they're, uh, they're very much behind the curve. And what I think is that uh, Yellen is... is and uh, the others are softening uh, the market up for an announcement on that December 15th meeting of a speed up of the taper, uh, which means a sooner rise of interest rates. And here it is. They're behind the curve. And now the odds of a marsh interest rates hike. Once again, a marsh interest rate hike is 50%. What does that mean? In all likelihood, in the next meeting for the Fed in December, they're going to announce ending all purchasing programs. They have to. They're going to be forced to do so because otherwise this country will dip into the Turkish scenario, the hyperinflation, the delusional madman scenario, which will push this country and the global economy into depression. So why isn't the bar well, I'm sorry, <laughs> Professor, why isn't the market then more worried about it? All right, if Yellen's worried about it, Powell's worried about well, it, the president's worried about it, everybody's worried about it. The market doesn't seem to be that worried about it. We're Why is the market not worried about it? Because the market is full of zombies, brainless zombies, gamblers, hooked up on drugs, chasing prices higher, looking for a quick score via call options, gambling on companies with no revenues, no profits. They believe that the Fed has their back. The market will never crash. Delusion combined with recklessness and arrogance, a lethal combination. But we're hardly well, down. I mean, you, I mean rates I, aren't I even that, up that much. Well, you, you, I mean, you, you saw the uh, what, what happened to technology, especially the high price technology. Today, you saw the yields are approaching 170 on the 10 year. I, I, I actually think what the market says is with the reappointment uh, of, of, of Chairman Powell, it gives them a little bit more free hand. Um, because uh, uh, to to raise interest rates. And what the good professor is saying here is, perhaps that the renomination is out of the way, now Powell has the room to be hawkish. And perhaps the renomination from Biden is, you know what, Powell? You created this mess. Now you deal with it, and you deal with the fallout. You are now forced to raise interest rates, not just taper, but to raise interest rates abruptly, which will crash the stock market and perhaps crash the economy. And that should be your rotten legacy. You should have tapered back in April. The worst case scenario is, if the economy slows down, you can put back these purchases on the table again. The risk of inaction is much larger than the risk of overreaction. Case in point, 2018, when the Fed started to raise interest rates and the market crashed. And the market spoke and said, you know what? Why would you raise interest rates right now when we don't have inflation? The Fed listened and said, you know what? You're right. We're going to reverse course 180. We're going to take all of these hikes off the table again. We're going to cut interest rates the market recovered right away. No harm done. Once again, the risk of overreaction is much smaller than the risk of inaction because waiting for inflation to get out of whack, to react, which by the way, the Fed is supposed to be proactive, not reactive. That risk is extremely dangerous because you're now going to be forced to taper everything. And not only that, but you're now forced to raise interest rates abruptly, to slam your foot on the brakes, and this will crash the stock market, the real estate market, and the economy. And who knows how we're going to revive the economy after that. But this is the genius, the financial engineering by the Fed, and the financial experimenting in the economy by the Fed. There is a dire price to pay, and we all going to feel the pain. And with that lovely note out of the way, let's move on to the market's coverage today, starting with the performance. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 194.55 points or a gain of 0.55%. The Nasdaq down by 79.62 points or a decline of a half a percentage point. The S&P 500 closing in the green by 7.76 points or a gain of 0.17%. And what about the sector's performance today, leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal? 
energy. Number two for the silver, financials. Number three for the bronze, defensives. The laggards of the day led by technology and consumer cyclicals. What about the advance to decline ratios? The NYSE, 50% advancing versus 48% declining. The NASDAQ, an awful 37% advancing versus 60% declining. Moving on to futures. So much for the release from the strategic reserve. Total jerk off, nothing happened. Oil prices actually shot up higher. Another genius idea by the Biden administration. The WTI gained about 2.5% today, while Brent surged higher by over 3.5%. Gasoline prices up, heating oil up, natural gas surging and gaining over 6% today. What a colossal failure. What about softs? We have gains led by coffee futures. Coffee futures exploding higher, folks. These price surges will be reflected in the prices that you and I, the consumer, are going to pay for the cup of coffee we're going to drink in the next few weeks and the next few months. Likewise, we have gains for lumber and sugar, all closing in the green today, while we have modest losses for cocoa and cotton, OJ futures pretty much closing at the flat line. What about metals? Gold down, silver down, platinum down, palladium down. Everything is down, with the exception of copper. Copper rising higher. Yields popping higher. This is driving gold and silver down, along with platinum and palladium. On the other hand, Dr. Copper remains the last man standing here. What about meats? Notable gains for feeder cattle futures gaining about one and three quarters of a percent today while live cattle futures pretty much on the flat line lean hogs losing a little over half a percentage point today what about grains we have decent gains for wheat corn and soybean oil futures while we have pullbacks in soybean meal oats and rough rice futures notable declines here for oats are they going to be sustainable or not that remains to be the question because oats futures have been exploding higher with no stop inside here and the rise in oat prices is being reflected in price surges and price increases from breakfast companies you heard the news from general mills for example they have no choice but to push prices higher even if these futures take a dip in the next few weeks, next month, there is a lagging reaction. The surge of oats prices will be reflected on us, you and I, the consumer, in December, January, and even February. We have soybeans and canola futures pretty much closing at the flat line. <music> Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? The hottest table by far remains Apple with about 1.8 million contracts exchanging hands today about 66 percent of those were calls Tesla number two with about 1 million contracts about 53 percent of those were calls and a number three AMD with about half a million contracts traded today about 62 percent of those were calls and here are the unusual activities that took place in the options market today starting with the ticker PAGS this is a Brazilian fintech company and the name is down big year to Date, and therefore we're going to see a lot of taxation harvesting from this name you got to sell your losers to reduce your taxes but we don't have a lot of losers year to date we have certain names zoom peloton paypal ruko zillow etc and you're seeing these names getting hammered pretty much every single day and the reason is taxation planning and this is one of these names and therefore the buying puts here the 22 and a half puts for the expiration date december 17th with expectations that the name could go down an additional 16 percent by then they paid about 45 cents a piece to enter the trade. all in all spending about eight hundred thousand dollars what about the trade for the ticker a r k k k k k k k k goes the buying puts here the 100 puts for the expiration date december 3rd with expectations that Tesla Witch ARK Invest ETF could drop by more than 6% by then, and they paid about one buck and 10 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about one and a half million dollars what about the trade for the ticker ddog data dog this is a big one the buying calls the 190 calls for the expiration date february 18th with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than six and a half percent by then and they paid about 14 bucks and a half a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about 23 million dollars now understand this on the other side of the trade there's somebody selling these calls meaning betting that data dog will actually crash and therefore capturing this value from selling the premiums what about the trade for the ticker xle somebody's buying puts here betting against energy they bought the 50 puts for the expiration date december 31st new year eve with expectations the xle could drop down by more than 12 and a half percent by then they paid about 45 cents to enter this trade all in all spending about five hundred and fifty thousand dollars. what about the trade for the ticker dbx 
dropbacks. They bought calls, a lot of calls today, specifically the 26 calls for the expiration date, December 17th, with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 6% by then. They paid all about 70 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $850,000. What about the trade for the ticker ZM Zoom? The name is crashing today. It's about to give up all of the gains, by the way, all of the hype. Zoom is the future, bro. No, it's not. It's just a video conferencing company. Dime a dozen. They're buying the puts here, the 190 puts for the expiration date, November 26th, with expectations that Zoom could drop down by more than 9% by then. They paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $1 million. What about the trade for the ticker DWAC, DWAC, DWAC the quack? Dropping big today, and they're bidding for more losses to come by buying the 35 puts for the expiration date, November 26th. With the expectations, the Dwack the Quack will drop down by more than 13% by then. They paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $600,000. What about this one? JWN for Nordstrom. Somebody got the news ahead of time because they bought a lot of puts here, and the name is crashing after hours. They bought the 27 puts for the expiration date this upcoming Friday, November 26th. And in all likelihood, of course, they're going to close these by tomorrow. And the expectation was that JWN will drop by more than 16% after the report comes out. And we now know that JWN Nordstrom is down more than 20% after the bell. So in all likelihood, they're going to close this one right away tomorrow. Anyways, they paid about 33 cents a piece for this trade and they spent about $220,000. Big score, Thanksgiving money. And lastly, at the bottom of the table, what about the trade for the ticker SPY, the S&P 500? They're buying puts here, the 418 puts, the expiration date, December 23rd, with the expectations that the SPY will go down by more than 10.5% by then. They paid about one buck and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $800,000. Moving on to the heat map analysis, what's going on here? Another day, and the inflationary trade continues to outperform. Yields are popping higher. This is not good for the high multiple, high growth names. And therefore, the software names are down. The crowd favorite names are down. Yet the big caps remain holding for now. Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook. This is what's keeping a tap on the declines for the Nasdaq. But if these names start to fall apart, then you will see the Nasdaq flushing down dramatically. But for now, value, aka the inflationary trade, financials, energy, materials, industrials, and consumer staples are outperforming for now. Will this continue? It depends because yields are about to pop higher. It looks like, from the charts at least, that the 10 year is about to reach 1.7, perhaps 1.8 and beyond. If it does, at some point, maybe banks are going to continue to outperform. But if yields surge out of whack, let's say 2% by the end of the year, then the expectations are that the Fed is going to raise interest rates to combat inflation. And if they do, they're going to slow down the economy. And therefore, the cyclical side is not going to work out anymore. We're talking about oil. We're talking about materials. We're talking about industrials. We're talking about the reopening names. Maybe banks and consumer staples will hold. But if the market starts to crash, the ETFization of the market will take place. And when the big caps go down, they're going to drag down everybody with them, including banks. And therefore, all eyes on big cap technology names, specifically Apple, because as Apple goes, so will the market. Moving on to charts, starting with the 30 minutes chart for the SPY. The writing was in the wall. We had the bear flag, followed by the flush down right away to where? To the support of 466. The SPY caught support and it bounced higher. Is it the bottom for now? Well, we have a low volume day. The majority of the action tomorrow will be pretty much within the first hour of the day. And after that, the volume will dry out. So if we have a flush down, target number one is 466. If that doesn't work, then we have 461 and a half. If the market stops there within the first or the second hour of the day, then the assumption is the market will recover and grind its way higher on low volume. It could be a down day overall, but the majority of the action will happen within the first two hours. And after that, it will be the opposite move. So if the market gaps up higher, in all likelihood, it will sell off by the end of the day. And if it gaps down, it will find a bottom within these numbers, 466 and 461 and a half. And then 
the market will grind its way higher. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract on the SPY? It's a good looking candle. It is a reversal candle, but for now, the double top scenario remains on the table. The SPY is outperforming right now because it includes energy, financials, materials, industrials, and staples. But what if these names start to underperform too? That's the risk here. There is a limit to how much the dollar and yields can pop higher and the market as a whole can hold. Now, the volume is picking up dramatically, contrary to the expectations before the week started. The expectations were that this will be the Thanksgiving week, low volume, the path of least resistance is higher, but we had a lot of events here. Number one, the renomination of Powell. Number two, the release of the strategic reserve. And the message here is inflation is becoming too much of a problem. And now it got the market's attention. Finally, when Biden two days in a row comes out and talks about inflation and about the risk to the economy, the role of the Fed, yada, 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 you can tell that the administration is shedding its pants right now looking at these inflation numbers. The momentum indicators are weakening. The MACD is now in the red, at least showing some red impressions on the histogram. It did not cross to negative territory yet, but it appears that it is on the way of doing so. Can the market hold on the backs of financials, energy, industrial, and materials? Not really. If the big caps start to fall, meaning Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, and even Tesla. If these names start to fall, then the SPY will not hold, even if financials, oil, industrials, or materials continue to rally. What about the Q's 30 minutes chart? What's going on here? Again, we had the bear flag, and guess what? Two important lines were breached today. Number one, the trend line. Number two, the support of 397, yes, the NASDAQ, the QQQ, managed to close above that number for now, but it managed to pierce below the number midday. What does that mean? The bears have one confirmation. The trend line is breached. We're waiting for 397 to be breached, meaning the NASDAQ closing the day below that number. That will be confirmation number two for the bears to double down, and the destination will be the support zone and that will be between 387 and 390. And watch how accurate and important 397 is. This is a three minutes chart for the triple Qs. The market opened gapping down. It caught support exactly in 397. It managed to close the gap and then it flushed down 180. And watch how the chart behaves around 397. It holds onto the number for a while, refusing to break holding, 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 and then finally it breaks and it consolidates below that number for a while. By the end of the day, the Qs give it another shot at 397. Perhaps dip buyers showing up, pushing the chart exactly to 397, and it faces resistance. This behavior indicates that 397 is an important number. There was a failure. The chart goes down, it consolidates, it gathers energy. And by the end of the day, it pushes higher again in a bull flag consolidation. And then it pops higher, finally above 397, closing the day above 397. So the bulls scored one point here, which is recapturing 397. And it was an epic battle, by the way. The bear scored the breach of the trend line. That's gone now, so bears got one point in their camp. The bulls have a point in their camp of recapturing 397. The bears have a slight advantage here, but the battle will go on. In all likelihood, assuming it will be a low volume day, we're not going to see a massive sell-off in the first two hours of the day. The bulls can perhaps push their way a little higher. They're not going to recapture the trend line, but they can re-solidify 397 for support. And here's a daily chart for the continuous contract in the NASDAQ, what's going on here. The momentum indicators are reversing now. Watch out the volume. The volume is exploding higher, higher than the sell-off back in September. This is an ominous signal that the action that we got today is not finished yet. We can rebound higher and low volume tomorrow, but the action will resume right after Thanksgiving. Moving on to a 30 minutes chart for the IWM, the Russell 2000. What's going on here? The IWM popped higher in the morning, but it got rejected right away from the resistance of 233. Watch how the algos respect the numbers, the numbers that I'm giving you. Here's a three minutes chart for the IWM. It pops higher right away. It gets rejected exactly to the penny from 233. It goes down, flushes down to the support of 229. It captures that support. It grinds its way higher, but it fails to recapture 233. So far, the bears have the advantage here until and unless the bulls push the Russell 2000 to close the day above 233. Absent of that, the bears continue to have the advantage here. Watch out for the contrast from the two components of the Russell. 
value versus growth. Last week, we looked at the weekly charts for both value and growth. Value, the IWD, growth, the IWF. The source of the weakening of the IWM last week was value, not growth. This week so far, value is outperforming growth. As you can see, we have a green candle from a weekly perspective on the IWD value. In contrast, when we look at the IWF growth, this is a weekly chart, of course. The candle so far is red, a damn candle. So the weakness, the source of the weakness this week so far at least, for the whistle, for small caps, is coming from growth. If you thought the market is confusing, it is about to get even more confusing. Last week, the assumption was growth is about to pop, value no good. This week so far, value back in charge, growth no bueno. These rotations back and forth, back and forth will smoke you. As a trader and market participant, if you don't have an ideology, if you don't have a thesis, if you're not in camp value or camp growth, and you have confidence in your positioning, if you are chasing the move week by week, value, then growth, then growth, then value, you're gonna get smoked. And here's a chart for the Dixie, the dollar index. What's going on here? It is eyeing 97 right now. However, studying the behavior of the chart, it appears that the Dixie is ready to pull back. The problem is, every time it is ready to pull back, another currency explodes. Last week was the euro due to the COVID lockdowns, and this week it is the Turkish lira. The dollar is waiting for one currency, one major currency, to start to rally so the dollar can catch a break. Absent of that, 97 will be the destination, at least for now. And is the rise in the dollar and the 10-year yield good for gold? Of course not. These are the two major enemies for gold, and gold is flushing down. Tough days for the gold bugs. It is not an inflation hedge, unfortunately, of course. It was in the 70s, but today it is not, due to the dynamic between gold, the dollar, and yields. And here's a chart for the 10-year yield. What's going on here? We have the reverse head and shoulder formation playing out, and now it is exploding higher. The momentum indicators are strengthening in positive divergence, meaning we have to eye 1.7 now. If 1.7 is broken quickly, that we have perhaps the highest readings in the 10-year yield for the year. Perhaps the next destination will be 2%. 2%, historically speaking, not a big deal for the NASDAQ, the SPY. Historically speaking, 2% is normal interest rates. But with this bloated market, with this out of whack valuation kind of market, a reading of 2% on the 10-year will be fatal. Once again, fatal even for the large caps. You're going to see the large caps melting. Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they're all going to go down. If 2% is reached rapidly, keyword rapidly, and by the way, this is a monthly chart for the 10-year yield. It appears that we have a cup and handle formation, perhaps one of the clearest cup and handle formations in any chart. What does that mean? We're going to see higher highs. We will probably see 2 2.5%, even 3 by 2022. Watch out here. And here is a weekly chart for the TLT. What's going on here? We have a reversal because we erased all of the gains from last week. Reversing the gains from last candle. Is this bullish or is it bearish? The answer is it is bearish. But the week is not over yet. We still have two days of trading. Anything could happen here. But if the TLT closes below last week's candle, then we have a reversal. And if yields read 1.8, 1.9, oh boy, we got a problem here. The NASDAQ is not going to hold. What about the VIX? Four hours chart. What's going on here? It continues to trade in positive territory in the MACD indicator. We have green impressions on the histogram. The VIX is eyeing 20. Can it close the week above 20? This is the challenge for the VIX. And if it does, it will be a massive win for bears and perhaps the beginning of the legitimate market reversal. Because you have a low volume week, you have a holiday week. The expectations are the market should have no trouble moving higher and the VIX should move down. The volatility should move down. But if the VIX rallies closing the week above 20 against all of these odds, it is a significant messaging from the market. The bears starting to gain the advantage. Moving on to Apple, a daily chart, what's going on here? It is re-attempting to break above the upper band of the channel. It is re-attempting to escape the channel. It failed once. Here's another shot. Could it happen? Yes, it could. It could happen if we have options participation in the next few days. We have tomorrow and we have Friday. If we have low volume in the market and the selling dries out, Yes, Apple can break out. And if Apple continues to hold, if it makes higher highs, then whatever pullback in the NASDAQ, not going to hold. You're going to see dip buyers buying and the NASDAQ moving higher again. To defeat the NASDAQ, the final boss here, 
is Apple. Once Apple start to weaken, once we see a reversal, once we see the volume surging higher on selling, then we got a problem. The final boss is getting hit, the NASDAQ, the SPY will flush down. But so long as Apple continues to hold, every dip in the market will be bought again. And here's a daily chart for Tesla, the souffle, what's going on here? In the morning, they gave it another shot at 1,174 and a half. What happened? They got rejected. This time around, we have a double rejection. The chart got rejected twice, and that was the confirmation for you to place an options, a put options trade. This is, of course, for the brave, the early riders, the risk takers. Conservative bears, on the other hand, will wait till 1,000 is breached for Tesla to close the day below 1,000, and then they're going to start to buy put options. Because for all you know, the selling dries out. That leaves the market wide open for the options speculators to bet Tesla price higher. What about BTC, tulips? What's going on here? It is catching the support of 55,300, but not decisively. Decisively means a big green candle pushing higher and perhaps closing above target number one, 60,351.51. If it happens, then you have a confirmation that 55,300 is a solid bottom and tulips will move higher. Buying right now is a little risky. Yes, it bounced higher from 55,000. 300. It actually was 55,400. It came close, but it doesn't matter. It is a zone. It is not an exact number. In theory, you could buy, but this is for the brave, for the risk takers. As we talked in Tesla's chart, the disciplined bears will wait till 1,000 is breached. The disciplined bulls in tulips, the disciplined dip buyers in BTC will wait till 60,351.51 is broken, meaning BTC's chart closed above that number for the day. And by the way, former presidential candidate, Secretary Clinton, she says cryptocurrency has the potential to destabilize nations and traditional currencies. She's against tulips. Let me know what you think about Hillary in the comments. In general, by the way, not just about these comments. What do you think about her in general? Love to hear from you. What about AMC? What's going on here? This is a 30 minutes chart, of course. We had the double rejection from 42 and a half, producing a flush down and now 39 is breached. Yes, AMC closed the day above 39, but it is not a solid reaction here. In all likelihood, AMC will give up 39 again. We will look down at 36 and a half for support. And lastly, by popular demand, what about GME GameStop? What's going on here? This is a weekly chart, by the way. Look at the MACD indicator. Strengthening, and there is the potential. Keyword potential. We will see a short squeeze by the end of the year. And the reason is, you have some hedgies losing money shorting the stock. They're going to book these losses, and therefore the expectations are we could, keyword could, see a short squeeze. I'd much rather be in GME, if you want to be crazy in YOLO meme stocks, I'd rather be in GME, not AMC. The weekly chart says we could see another episode of the mania popping higher. Your threshold is the trend line. If that is broken, then you know it's over and GameStop will go down to the garbage, to the dumpster. Absent of that, there is still the hope that a short squeeze could happen by the end of the year. Now, don't bet the house on it, just the wife and the kids. Anyhow, moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have in the economic calendar tomorrow? Busy, because they're jamming everything in a single day. We have, in the morning, the initial jobless claims for the week. We have durable goods. We have personal income. We have disposable income, we have consumer spending, core inflation, new home sales, and perhaps an important one, the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. And lastly, we have the FOMC minutes. Now, we're not expecting fireworks here. The most important Fed meeting will be in December, but this could be an appetizer. Now that Powell is renominated and we have Brain Dead as vice chair, it will be important to look at. But again, remember this the majority of the action, historically speaking, in Thanksgiving Eve is within the two hours in the beginning of the day. So far, we have been defying the trend. So everything is possible here, but keep your expectations within reason. Anyhow, folks, I'm beat up. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.